Anytime somebody visits us here at CJ Pony Parts, they're always amazed at the size of the company. Now, it started out over 35 plus years ago with two guys in the back of the barn, has grown into a company that ships all over the world with four properties in three states. Now, obviously, it hasn't always been that way. So today, we give you a rare look inside of CJ Pony Parts as we sit down with the owner, Jay, and let him tell you the story in his own words. So we're here with Jay, who is one of the founders and the current owner of CJ Pony Parts. Jay, we appreciate you taking some time this morning. I know uh, you are a little anxious about being on camera, but you get to see our world for a change today. Let's talk about CJ's. Let's talk about the history. Obviously, nobody can tell the story better than the man who's been here since the beginning. So you were pretty much a teenager when you started CJ's. How did this company come about? I mean, what, what made you want to be in the Mustang parts business? I was a senior in high school, 1984. I was out driving around with my girlfriend, found a 1968 Mustang sitting in someone's yard. I'm like, oh, that's a cool car. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Showed my girlfriend, she's like, oh, that's a piece of junk. Took my sisters, showed my sisters, they're like, oh, that's a piece of junk. Took my good friend Creed, he's like, oh, that's cool. We gotta have it, it's $400. So we each gathered up 200 bucks and we bought it. We went there on a Sunday morning and took uh, some starter fluid, battery cables, battery, and uh, got the thing running, drove it down the highway. No insurance, no registration, no plates. Nice and safe. On We've 80, all been there. On 81, back <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah. Yep. Drove it back to my parents' house, and, uh, and that's how it all began. We found it there, and my I brought it home. My dad's like, "You're not keeping that piece of junk in our driveway." I'm like, "Oh, I'm gonna, Dad. It's gonna be cool." That's how it started. So Creed's the one that saw something in it with me, and uh, that's how it all started. We and that car back. is still with you to this day. It's with us to this day. It's uh, the original car. We restored it back to original color, seafoam green. Back in the day when we restored it, jacked up with shackle kits and Kragers and- uh, Air shocks. Yes, and air <laughs> shocks to keep it from rubbing. Yeah, Home so- speakers uh, in the trunk, all that kind of fun stuff yep, we did back the in the day. Six by nine triaxles in the oh, back. Oh yeah, yep, yep. So I graduated that year, so luckily I got to take it back, and Creed was a senior that year, so he was like, oh, that's cool, man. You got that car because I paid him the $200 back. Okay, because so, he had a 67, I believe. Yeah, they, so then yeah. he bought a 67 that we couldn't fix because it was too rusted out. So we bought a third car and made one out of, made a 67 out of those two 67s. Okay. Ended up with some extra parts and uh, that's you how it all got started. Game. Yep, that's how I got started. What was it about Mustang that made you want to buy that car and start a company based around it? I mean, was it, was it, were you a Mustang guy or were you just a car guy and that happened to be the one you found? I'd like all classic cars. Didn't matter if it was a Challenger or a GTO, whatever. I like classic cars. So I bought different cars over the years, but Mustangs are always, they're just so iconic. Like when I was a kid, I'd see them. It's like, they're so cool. Like didn't matter if they were factory original convertibles or they were jacked up or they were GT 500s or whatever they would be. It's like, I don't know, Mustangs always turn my head. Like you hear, to this day, like you hear a Mustang, you know it's coming. You still see it, yep. yeah. Yep. So I guess Mustang was my favorite of all classic cars. So when you had those 267s, you had some, had some parts left over, you took them to Carlisle. At that point, did you realize that could become a business or was it just, let's get rid of some spare parts? It was fun and we made extra money. So we actually didn't make any money because if we sell a few parts, have a few hundred dollars, we'd go buy another car. We'd buy a car for $200, $300. Exactly. We'd sell a hood or a pair of fenders off of it and pay for the whole car. We'd take that money and buy another one. We would buy as many cars as we could afford or his father would let us keep on the property, okay. which was 10. So and there were 10 was the maximum? 10, 10 junk cars. So if we got to 11, we had to scrap one. In doing that in parting, I mean, how many years were you doing that as almost a side business before it became what you saw the potential as a career? In 1989, I quit my job, and then a few months later, he quit his job. I moved out of my parents' house because I knew my dad wouldn't appreciate that uh, I was parting out junk cars. So I moved out in December of 88, and then January of 89, I resigned from my job at Rite Aid. We went on the road that year. We bought a truck, a trailer, and we traveled to 26 car shows that year. Wow. So we would take used stuff. We would take everything off, paint it primer black. So it would be bumper brackets, whatever we had, nice bumpers, fenders, whatever. Everything was painted primer black. Hot rod black. Okay. So we'd take it and then we would to make it look almost NOS even yes, though it was used. Yes, exactly. My favorite story or, or or times were going to the car shows. When we'd have the crews to go to Englishtown, New Jersey or Columbus, Ohio, to get that crew of like ten of us in two trucks and trailers and rider trucks, pack everything we owned in those things and go. And it would be twenty four hours a day working for from Thursday night till Monday morning. But the camaraderie we had, like our team was so much fun to be with. Like car shows were, that's how this company got rolling. That was Hand it. it. Handing out business cards, priceless catalogs. But the people you meet, like the vendors and the, 
and the customers that come back to every single show, those, those were good times. The face -to -face I marketing that. Yeah. different. It really yeah, was. It, they, they, were, they were fun. I do miss those trips. So obviously in the 90s, the company started growing a lot more. What challenges did you start seeing then once the company, because at that point you had employees and it was a you know, it was a bigger deal. What kind of challenges were you facing then? Always the same thing. I mean, there would be days where the phone didn't ring. In those days, you would have the parts there. So you'd have the three or $4,000 of the new inventory sitting there but the phone didn't ring. So you had to wait for the monthly magazines to come out, Mustang Monthly or... That was back before yes. the internet was working. Yeah, so there was no so. internet. So you handed out your catalogs, you handed out your business cards and prayed the phone would ring. And you were hoping for Christmas, you were hoping for tax returns. Same thing as now, in our busy times of the year. Now was, I mean, growth is obviously a big part of CJ's these days as we're growing all over the place, but was growth always the goal? Were you trying to build a big company or was no. it just keep you two employed? To be self-employed was the original goal. When we moved to the facility on Allentown Boulevard, our first new building, we had six employees and my goal was to not have more than 20 because I did the payroll, I did everything and I didn't want to have more than 20 employees. So in that first year, I think we had 21 employees okay. in 99 when we moved to that building. And how many do we have now? We have about 180 right now. I was going to say, did you ever envision that CJ's would become what it is? I mean, we are the, the largest full range Mustang company in the world. No, that was never the goal. The goal was to be self-employed, get up every day and do this. and. I love it like I did and the first And you still day. do. Yep. What do you see as the future seat is? I mean, obviously it was always, you said you started off, it was only the Mustangs you liked. A few years ago, we got into the Focus market, the Fiesta market, we did some trucks, some Jeep. You know, where do you see CJ's going in the future? I think we're really good at classic cars. We can do anything, but I think classic cars and trucks is where we belong. So I, I see C10s and F100s, Broncos, the new Bronco will be great. That will be cool. Um, so I, I see classic trucks, classic vehicles, more along those lines. Does it ever just hit you what you've built here? I mean, how many families this company supports? How many people have grown while working for you at TJ Pony Parts? It, it is surreal. Every day I wake up, I have to pinch myself because I am truly living the dream. Like, I love doing this like the first day when I bought that 68 Mustang in that field. This is great. And yes, I feel obligated to all our employees. I feel responsible. It's great that this business has grown to support this many employees and families. You can't beat it. I wake up every day and get to do what I want to do. So I love it. Well, Jay, we want to thank you for building this for all of us and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Bill.